So we're going to talk about constraints or enforcing constraints, which I think was foreshadowed a lot by the last lecture. But the real goal, wh where we're moving at this point in the course, which is almost the last um, set of topics. So we've got to talk about this next set of things, the so-called ACID compliance of database systems. And then we have to talk a little bit about performance issues. So um, it, we're going to start by contextualizing this in terms of constraints. But it, it's helpful to think back to the very beginning of the course, because we, we spent a lot of time talking about what does it mean to define data? What's a data model? How do we define a normalized schema? How do we run queries? How do we insert data? But at the very beginning, um, maybe you recall that, that the, the key uh, requirement we imposed on database systems was that they were a way of taking away from us, the users of the data, all of the maintenance uh, and the mechanics of sharing data that was normally associated with large-scale databases. The idea being that, um, as you've seen with assignments three and four, a hundred people can run queries simultaneously on the same database, and somehow all of that is managed behind the scenes. We send our query to the database system, and for all we're concerned, we're the only person using it at the time. Um, and so we want to treat, uh, ideally, uh, as the user of the data, we want to treat the database system as a black box. We send our queries in and then results come back. And it's, it's magic as far as we're concerned. We do not care about things like how many machines are really there. How, do they store the, the records on disk? Do they store them in memory? Is it a cluster of machines? Is it a cluster of disks that it uses? Is it some sort of cloud system? Who cares? We send a query in, we get results back. Um, and so, of course, we still want to maintain that. Now, we, in a databases course, we, we do have to see what's inside a black box like that. Um, we also maybe are aware of some basic requirements we impose on any system <clears throat> that's storing a um, huge set of data that we expect to be persistent. For example, we hope the data doesn't disappear overnight. We want to make sure that uh, it's secure, we want to make sure that it's accessible, uh, and we want to make sure that it's durable. Um, and it turns out that we can characterize the expectations that we have of database systems uh, in terms of the data being reliable, in terms of results being reliable, uh, also in terms of um, the data maintaining a consistent state, and multiple users perhaps being able to use the data simultaneously in terms of this framework that is called ACID which we talked about very briefly, I think, in the second lecture. And I think it also came up in the introductory example. Uh, and so it turns out that this, this ACID compliance is observed by most of the relational database systems you're likely to see. So Postgres is certainly one of them. SQLite is one of them. Um, and part of the, the ACID compliance also can guarantee that if you impose constraints on consistency, that those are always observed. Um, now, as we saw at the beginning of the course, we consider this to be the, the um, absolutely primary goal of a database system. I don't care if it's slow. Uh, I don't care if it's inconvenient to use. What I care about is the data's integrity is maintained, that the disk doesn't crash, that the uh, that invalid data can't get into the system, that multiple users see a consistent view of the data at all times. I don't care about anything else if those things can't be upheld. Um, and that's the key difference talking um, about database systems in a course like this versus the way you would have worked for, with data in some other course, uh, which is obviously in other courses we think about performance. Well, we, we care about performance with database systems, obviously. We're going to talk about that later in July. But uh, ultimately, we don't care about performance if it means compromising the integrity of the data. Um, and so the key idea here and in these next few lectures is that a lot of the things we're going to describe may even appear sort of impractical, but ultimately uh, integrity is the only thing we care about. Until we can ensure that, we don't care about performance efficiency or scalability. Now, it's worth considering, as we have in, earlier in the course, that there are database systems. I mean, first off, there are plenty of non-relational database systems, uh, and there are relational ones that have different priorities, where occasionally we do want to sacrifice data integrity in the interest of performance, in many cases because if we didn't, we wouldn't be able to have either. Um, so one example would be if you're collecting analytics, uh, let's say based on uh, user activity on the internet, and, you, and you're, you are, let's say, maybe surreptitiously, who knows, let's say that you're monitoring uh, internet traffic from millions and millions of users uh, because, for example, you're Google and you embed ads into pages. 
Uh, it could be that millions and millions of pieces of data are coming in every second. And if you want to process them, you might have to lose a few. You, you physically can't handle all of the bandwidth. For, uh, Google doesn't have that problem, but in general, maybe the data you're collecting is some sort of statistical information. And if you lose a couple of data points, who cares as long as you can process? That's an example of a system where integrity isn't the top priority. Now, in the context of the systems we've been discussing in this course, integrity is the top priority, and we're going to proceed uh, under, under that assumption. Um, and even if you end up working in a setting where you're working with data systems where integrity isn't the top priority, where losing a bit of data here and there isn't a big deal, um, without the understanding of how to ensure integrity, it's very hard to actually know how to sacrifice it properly. So what is the ACID framework? Um, it's not a standard. This is just a, a set of goals that database systems strive to achieve, and they're broad categories. So there's not, we're not trying to um, uphold some standards document here. Uh, and we're going to spend uh, the next three components, so it's three or, three or four lectures, I think, most of which on this one. But um, we're going to spend the next bit of the course talking about all three of these, these first, uh, AC and I. Um, so I can briefly define them. We're going to spend most of this lecture on the middle one because it's a good transition from the applied SQL stuff we've been doing into this ACID compliance stuff. Um, so I can start with that. Consistency is the, the attribute that from the point of view of any outside user of the database system, so any data user that can send queries to the database system or anything else, create statements, whatever, any user that can see the database will never observe any state of the database where all of the constraints on the data model are not always obeyed. Ab under all circumstances, any query you do on a database with a constraint um, must always produce a result that obeys that constraint. <clears throat> So an example being, if we require in our database, we've got ships and we've got captains, that every ship has a captain, it is impossible if consistency is observed for any query at any time to uh, return data that would suggest that there's a ship with no captain. So any constraints we define, even arbitrary ones, must always be obeyed from the point of view of any outside observer. And we'll notice that maybe there's some weasel words there. Why is it from the point of view of an outside observer? Um, and, and the key there is whether you're inside or outside the black box. If you are the database system software yourself, you're going to observe all sorts of weird stuff. But if you're a user on the outside sending in queries, you must always see a consistent view of the data. It might change over time, but it must, at any given moment in time, it must be consistent. Um, atomicity, which we'll talk about next after consistency, uh, is that if a user executes some operation, some complicated set of um, ta some complicated task that can be broken into simpler operations, where the operation requires multiple steps, then they should be able to e expect, and they would indicate this in advance. So it's not if they wish to use this feature, they should be able to expect that either their entire operation will succeed or the entire operation will fail and there's nothing in between. So an example would be in our typical database with the fruit. Um, suppose I want to add orders to my database, <clears throat> and I add each order one at a time. So I add the order by first adding um, the order to the orders table, and then a whole bunch of orders to the uh, order contents to my order contents table. So I might add in total thousands of rows. Suppose something goes wrong midway through. I, have, I should be able to expect if atomicity is being observed that either the entire order ends up getting added or nothing happens. Even if I send hundreds of insert statements, if something goes wrong in the middle, the database acts as if nothing happened. So I can define a large task, and I can begin performing it, and if something goes wrong in the middle, it's as if I never started. So that's atomicity. Stuff either happens or it doesn't, and that, that applies to individual operations, and it applies to compound operations. Um, isolation is the is how concurrency factors into this, and that's why we're going to spend more time on it. It'll be after the uh, July 13th exam. Um, isolation is that if there are multiple users of the data system, as we know can definitely uh, exist, because we've all been using the same server all semester, um, if we have multiple users all performing modifications concurrently, two sets of operations being performed by those two users should not interfere with each other. Now, it's possible that, I mean, obviously you can think of cases where two different users are performing apparently orthogonal modifications on the database. So, so one person's modifying the orders table, one person's modifying the products table. It's pretty hard for them to get into each other's way. But it's also possible that both users are trying to modify the same row in the same table. 
Isolation is the property that if two users attempt to perform operations and those operations succeed, that neither user's operations interfered with the others. Now it's possible that if interference is basically um, guaranteed, like if the two operations collide with each other, then one of them might have to fail. But ultimately, if there are two users that are successful in a modification, then those modifications should not interfere with each other. And we'll notice going forward that we always have this one safety valve, which is that operations can fail. There are times when something that's being attempted cannot be allowed to succeed. And we'll see a lot of that in this lecture, the one we're going to talk about um, today, which is obviously if we're enforcing consistency constraints, like every ship must have a a captain and you try and add a ship without a captain, that operation has to fail. If I allow you to do that, then I have allowed inconsistent data to exist. Now the fourth part of the, dur of the um, ACID uh, framework is what's called durability, which um, if the semester were longer and we, we weren't already running out of patience, then maybe we'd have time to cover it. Some offerings of 370 spend less time on the other aspects and talk more about durability. It's just a matter of what we can choose to keep in the time that we have. Um, so I'm, I'm not going to cover it in this semester uh, because it's also something that is covered a lot. It, it overlaps a lot with CSC 360. So durability is, uh, broadly speaking, um, and we have to be careful about this, but if you look at the way it's covered in, for example, our book, um, it tends to be couched more in terms of, okay, the database server is storing the data on disks. How do we make sure that the, um, that, you know, we don't lose all the data overnight. So that is to say, if a disk breaks, which can happen, that uh, we don't lose the data. Well, so an example would be maintaining backup copies, maintaining parallel copies of it, splitting it over multiple nodes or something. Um, this is actually a really interesting topic. It's just that it's a bit further away from what we care about in this course than the other three. So we're going to pretty much not emphasize it in this offering, although the book does cover it, and it is covered to a large part by a lot of topics that typically show up in CSC 360. <clears throat> So what is consistency? Um, within our ACID framework, consistency is the assurance that whatever you've defined, uh, and this is a, a very significant, um, for the most part, these constraints I keep talking about, structural constraints, these are things that you, the database designer, have somehow created. They could be primary keys, they could be foreign keys, they could be arbitrary functions that, al that always run when you do an insertion. Um, consistency is the assurance that no matter what constraints you've defined, they are always obeyed. And to be clear, we shouldn't think about constraints as something that uh, are, as things that are enforced at given times. Instead, we should think about constraints as properties of the universe. If I define a constraint on a database, so every ship has a captain, then at any moment, anybody observing any part of that database should see a view of the world that is consistent with that constraint. So there will never be a ship with no captain in my data set. There could be no ships and no captains, but there could never be an actual ship that does not have an associated captain. So uh, we will, of course, discover that the best way to implement constraints is as things that are enforced at specific moments in time. That is, if you, for example, if you want to create a new ship, you must have a captain or the insertion should fail. But we shouldn't think about constraints as they exist in those terms. We should think about them in terms of um, properties we can always expect to hold. Now we have to talk about this to any outside observer business. Um, and the key distinction between the constraints we're about to talk about and what we've already seen, like primary key constraints, is it's possible that um, some constraints um, can't be enforced or, or we can't guarantee that they're true until we've done more than one operation. So uh, what I'm, this idea of an outside observer is anybody who queries the database at any time will always observe a state that is consistent with all constraints. While you're constructing your data set, you might end up momentarily, and this is of course a loaded term, momentarily, you might end up momentarily violating a constraint. Um, but any violation that you, that you create momentarily must be resolved before any outside observer can see the state of the database. Uh, and, and so the idea there is if every ship has a captain, so conceptually that's this problem here, we'll, we'll come back to it in the next lecture, but in my ER diagram, I might have this situation. And we've described how to turn this into tables, but we haven't really described how we're supposed to deal with it. Okay, so we have two entities, ship and captain, and they've got attributes, who cares what they are. Every ship has exactly one captain. Every captain has exactly one ship. Now, I mean, that's weird, because I guess a captain can have multiple ships. But suppose we, we design this database. 
We've seen how to turn this into tables, but we haven't yet really had it, ex had it explained how to resolve a weird chicken and egg problem, which is, if every ship has to have a captain, how do I add ships? I mean, there's no captains yet, so how do I add the first ship? Well, oh, I don't know. I guess you have to have a captain first, Bill. Fair enough. How do I add captains if every captain has to have a ship? It looks as if you can, you can never add anything to this database because to do anything, you have to break a rule. What the definition about the outside observer is really saying is there is a mechanism that exists, which we'll see in the next lecture, that allows you to tell the database, hold on a minute, I'm going to do a few things at once. And you then give a bunch of operations. The operations could be add a captain, add a ship, link the captain and ship together. And when you're done, you tell the database, okay, now I'm good. The database then does all the operations at once. And as long as the constraints hold after all of them are done, then the consistency, all of the consistency conditions are met. But we are allowed to temporarily suspend enforcement of constraints as long as we do it inside of a finite window, which is called a transaction, which we'll talk about in what that's actually verges on atomicity as opposed to consistency. So what we're going to talk about for the time being is how to enforce constraints. And then later we'll talk about how do we uh, allow constraints to be violated inside of a transaction. And it'll come when we talk about atomicity. So of course, before we can do anything, to, like before we can worry about that, the key issue for today is we need the ability um, to guarantee consistency, which means we of course need the ability to specify ab basic, I mean, for all intents and purposes, completely arbitrary conditions that are enforced on the data. And the, the usual safety valve applies. If you try to add or modify data in a way that would violate the constraints, your operation fails. Um, so we can always prevent an operation from uh, being successful by just rejecting it outright. We don't have to provide some alternative pathway to it succeeding. So what are some constraints we've already seen? Um, we've seen primary key constraints. If a table has a primary key and we try and add two rows that have the same values in all key columns, the second insertion is rejected. The database says can't do it. There already is a row with that value. Um, we've seen foreign key constraints, and if you've already watched the demo video that went with the last lecture, you've seen an example of me trying to violate one with an update or with a, um, uh, a, a delete statement. Uh, and the database, if uh, with a foreign key constraint is saying the row, every row of this table refers to a row of a different table. And if you try and delete the row of the table that's being referred to, the database says, I'm sorry, you can't do that. I need this for something. So it guarantees that the that there always is that re that reference always exists. Um, we'll see in a minute a check constraint, which is to enforce a simple Boolean condition on specific um, attributes inside of a row. Um, and then there are these two. So advanced constraints fall into these two categories. Now, it really, I mean, if you read about assertions in the um, in the book. They sound like exactly what we want. They're, they're perfect. For things like assignment six, uh, assertions are great. Um, for some reason, well, uh, database, uh, the people writing this software have a good reason. It's performance. Assertions are basically not supported um, or, or weren't um, until very recently in most database systems and not very consistently. And so as a result, uh, we, we, don't, we can't write assertions because Postgres won't let us. So instead, we have this other option, which is Postgres provides you the option of every time an operation is performed on a given table, like an insert or an update or a delete, to call a function. And that function is allowed to raise a red flag and just say stop. And if it says that, then the operation fails. So uh, we, we call this a trigger, um, and in particular, a constraint trigger, although a trigger can be used for other purposes besides constraints. And we will talk about some of those other purposes as well. And this is an arbitrary condition because it's just calling a function. We've already seen we can write functions, and maybe you can take my word for it, but you can write functions that do just about anything you want. So here's the CR diagram above. We've already seen the basic conversion. How do we turn entities and relationships and the basic constraints into tables? But conspicuously absent from that was a discussion of how to handle the complicated cardinality constraints or the sort of strange cardinality constraints. So here, um, if I want to enforce the many to one relationship student, every student uh, enrolls in exactly one major. What I would do is I would probably have the major be an attribute of the student entity. Um, or of the student uh, relation, and I use a foreign key to guarantee that that major actually was one of the majors in existence in, in the table for majors. So the foreign key constraint there would force the um, student's chosen major to be valid. Um, and uh, I'd end up with something like this. So I have a set of majors, there they are, um, and the names of majors are unique, which is enforced quite nicely by this primary key directive here, 
And then I have this students table where I just fold the major name, because I know every student has to have a major. I fold that into the students table. Um, of course, I have to make sure that the name of the major actually matches a real major that exists somewhere. So I add this foreign key, which says wh whatever the value of this is actually has to match up with some entry of this table here. Okay, so that guarantees that every major a student can have is a real major. But I have another issue, which is how do I force this um, rounded arrow? I want there to be exactly one major. And so in this case, well, if this has a value, if this is any string, it'll have to be an actual major. So the student has a major. They can't have two because it's only in the, the row once. But what about zero? Um, and it depends on how you interpret it, but I guess I could have a null value. And a foreign key constraint doesn't get enforced on null values. So an, a, a column that is a part of a primary key cannot be uh, have a null value. And if a um, column that's, that is the subject of a foreign key, uh, or the object of a foreign key, I guess, the, the column that is being used to refer to a different table, if it has a null value, then that key is, the key constraint is not enforced. Um, because I don't want students to have no major, I want to force this column to never have a null value. Um, I want them to always actually have a real major. So what you can do is add to the end of um, any declaration uh, of a column inside the create table statement the words not null. I, as usual, that's a SQL keyword, so we'll, it could be in all caps, but we just want to take it easy in the actual code here. So not null says if you attempt to insert or modify a row such that this column has a null value, the operation fails. That means the column always has a value, and by extension, because the value is forced to always agree with the majors table, every student must have exactly one major. So what do we do about this? Maybe, I don't know, thinking about that last example, this might be, um, might follow a bit. So we have the solid arrow, which means zero or one. A student enrolls in zero or one majors. What I could do, I actually have a few options here. Um, what I could do is I could just say, fine, the major column still exists in the students table, but now it can be null. And if you want the student to have zero majors, set it to null. Great. If it's, and again, if the value is null, this foreign key constraint is just ignored because there's no way, of course, the value null would never appear as the value in the primary key column of the majors table. And that's one option. There are a few others. Uh, depending on how you tackle this, you could also just break the um, major, the students enrolling in a major into its own table and then play a couple of games with keys. So I could have this table that indicates uh, for each student that's in the table what their major is. So I have my students, there they are, and I've got my majors, and then I've got this table in major. The idea being, if a student appears in this table, then they do have a major. But of course, there's no requirement that every student appear in the in major table. So I'm, always, I'm also allowed to leave a student out, which means they have no major. Um, this is a bit overcomplicated once you've seen this solution, but it might not be so obvious that you could use a solution like this. Uh, and so the in major table has been designed carefully to make sure students can't have two majors. So notice that uh, a student can be absent from the in major table. If they're present, then the student ID has to match up with the student's table by the foreign key, so it'd have to be a real student. The major has to match up with the major's table, so it has to be a real major. So if a student is present, they, their major must be valid. Um, because the primary key is just the student name or the student ID, there's no way for a student to appear in this in major table twice. So that means either a student is in the table, so they have a major, or the student is not in the table, so they don't have a major. So just by combining together primary key, foreign key, and not null, we can already enforce some interesting constraints. Um, but it does still, um, this is just explaining that, it does still leave us uh, with a problem like this. We're allowed to create completely arbitrary cardinality constraints. We might even have constraints that can't be written on an ER diagram. So we'll see on assignment six, you're asked to enforce constraints that are above the ER diagram level. They're not just how do we lay out the data, they're enforcing rules on what data can be allowed, to, which entities can be allowed to exist and when. Um, and so we need, at minimum, just to realize our ER diagrams, a way of realizing a funny looking constraint like this, less than or equal to two, or, or at most 10 students can major in philosophy, or uh, it must be between three and seven, things like that. Um, so uh, I wanna talk about that. So I wanna talk about the way we would enforce an apparently arbitrary condition. Um, but uh, I, I wanna um, first take a quick diversion 
I foreshadowed this uh, in that video I posted about um, with the demo of the last lecture, um, but I want to talk about the more advanced features of the foreign key constraint. In particular, how do uh, modifications apply? If I, if I modify or delete something in one table that's relied upon by another table, what happens? So think about it like this. Suppose we have a student, Bill, um, who is enrolled in the major um, philosophy. Maybe I'm thinking of a career change. I don't know. Um, so I'm enrolled in the major philosophy. What if I rename this? I mean, that could happen. What if I want to rename the major philosophy to something, I don't know, use some university speak, philosophical studies or something? So the question there is, um, I should be allowed to do that. I should be able to rename the major because maybe the major doesn't exist and it's with its current name anymore. But the major is being relied upon by a, an element of another table. What do I do? Um, certainly if the major isn't neat, if nobody's in that major, it's easy to rename it. But what if somebody is? So I need some way of handling that. And then also, what if I wanted to delete the major? Well, I, I mean, I should be allowed to do that, but what if people rely on it? What do I do then? So I need some way of specifying a policy for what should be done. I mean, I could just say you can't. If people rely on this major, it's your business to fix the problem. Either remove the students, remove them from the major, or, or just keep the major. But you can't have it both ways. And we're allowed to do that. We're allowed to uh, enforce that you can't rename the major until you've removed all the students from it. But it should be up to us, the database designers, to decide what policy gets enforced. Um, oh, this is not using philosophy. Okay, so suppose I had a major called information science, and there used to be lots of majors called that, and we, we, we love these days the term data science. So suppose we choose to rename our major data science. What do we do with all those students that have a mapping from themselves to the major named information science? Like seriously, we have to think, we have to have a policy. Do we just deny the rename or do we, uh, do we have it propagate through? Um, and then similarly, suppose, I don't know why I'm picking on computer, suppose I, I delete computer engineering. Okay, suppose I insist on having some mechanism to do that. What should it be? Should I have to remove all the students from it first? Um, should I remove the students from it automatically? I need to have some way of controlling what happens if I modify a table and other tables depend on its data. So the foreign key constraint, uh, when you specify it, and we've actually, some of the, the code that I've posted already contains this. I've just left it in there and haven't explained it. Now we're finally seeing what's going on. The foreign key constraint and the, the new lines in Whitespace are my own addition. You could put them all in the same line if you want. They contain the ability to specify policies for what happens if a if the key on the other end is deleted or updated. So this is the order contents table. Every, or every entry in the order contents table refers to an order number and a product ID. But the question is, if this refers to product ID number four, and I decide later to delete product four, what should I do? If I decide later to renumber product ID four to be product ID 10, what should I do? And these um, foreign key policies give me some way of, of uh, indicating that. Now, one thing we have to be very careful about is that the policy that we're using here um, dictates what happens if a modification occurs in this table. So order contents refers to the orders table. These policies refer to what I do if a deletion or update occurs to this table, the table that the foreign key refers to, not to the table I'm creating. Um, the, the propagation I specify could affect the table I'm creating, but this is on a deletion in the orders table, on an update of the products table. So what are the options? Um, so I say on delete something, on update something. The options I have are, if, I, if uh, my order number column refers to the orders table and I delete the order number for the current row in the order contents table, one option is set the order number null in this table. Uh, another option would be to cascade the deletion. So if I delete an order number from the orders table, delete all rows with that order number from the order contents table. Cascade that. And that could go through multiple layers of cascading. And of course, I'll post a demo video where I show this off um, separately after this lecture. Um, another option would be restrict, and that's the default policy. So if, if you don't specify anything, um, the default policy is restrict. And that says, so suppose I have a, the product ID in my order contents table refers to the products table. Suppose that I have an order, so suppose in order 1001, I have product ID 4, 0 0.5 kilograms. What if I try and delete product 4 from the products table? 
This policy says restrict. If you try to delete a product that I need in the order contents table, don't allow it. The operation will fail. Restrict the operation from occurring. Cascade says that if I modify the products table and I modify something that order contents needs, so suppose I, re I try and change the ID of product four to be ID 100, the Cascade says, okay, that's allowed, but then make the same modification to the order contents table automatically. Have it propagate through. Um, set null, if I use the set null policy here, it would just set it to null if I delete or update it, which obviously I, I'd rather not do that in this case. Um, there are occasions to use all three policies, but to play it safe, it's often better to use restrict unless you can think of a, an explicit justification for why to use set null or cascade. So restrict is the default policy. If, I, uh, if in the order contents table I am referring to products or order numbers and, and the, the tables that, that, that are the home of those things, like the orders table or the products table, if I try and delete or update product uh, order numbers or product numbers and I have a restrict policy in place, like I do here, the restrict policy says you may not make the modification if it affects the order contents table. So any product ID that I am using in a row of order contents cannot be deleted. So if I want to delete a product, I would have to delete it first from order contents and then from the products table. And that's the default policy. If you don't specify something here, it just gets automatically set to restrict. Um, and so the effect of that, of course, is that some deletions or updates get just denied. They, they are not allowed to occur. The cascade policy uh, attempts to, if you update the parent table, so in this case, um, the product ID and order contents refers to the product ID of products. If I attempt to update the products table with a different product ID, that update cascades into order contents. Um, if there are other tables that refer to order contents, it might cascade to them. But the key here is that the cascade has to be allowed by every table. If there is a cascade that affects another table, that relies on order contents, and that table has a restrict constraint, then the operation has to fail. And, the opera and when we talk about an operation failing, I'm referring to the entire operation. So if any error, if any restrict occurs in the long sequence of cascading changes that might be required, if any error occurs due to a restrict, the whole operation fails. So everything, all the way up to the top, completely fails and, and no modification occurs. Um, and so, I mean, this is giving a secondary example. If I update product ID number six to have ID 600, then the modification would cascade into any rows of the order contents table that contain ID number six, and they would be changed to have ID 600 automatically. Um, the set null policy says that in, if you make an update or, del or you delete something uh, and you have a set null policy active, so an example here, if I delete order number 10, then any entry in the order contents table, if I delete this from the orders table, any entry in the order contents table that refers to order 10 would automatically have its order number set to null. That is probably a bad idea here in this particular, I, mean, I just had to put set null somewhere, but um, in this particular database, you really would rather not, I think, have order contents entries with a null order number. If you delete the order, you probably want to delete all the order contents as well. So you'd actually want to cascade the deletion. Um, and the slides, okay, the slides agree with what I just said. We, we probably don't want to have null um, values in the order contents table. And the slides even point out that because order number is a primary key column, you're not even allowed to. So that set null actually has the effect of being a restrict. So one thing I notice, and this is just, if you want to set off a flashing red light for an exam question, here's where to do it. This is the number one reason people lose marks on exam questions about this the foreign key constraint. They forget that the policies I define in order contents, so when I say this foreign key has an on delete restrict on update cascade, this policy only applies to what do I do to rows in the order contents table. So I'm allowed to, del if I try and delete a product which has any presence in the order contents table, restrict means it fails. But if I try and delete a product that doesn't exist in the order contents table, so a product that was never ordered, that's fine. This policy doesn't affect any rows that aren't in the order contents table. 
So these policies affect updates and deletions in the table being referred to, like the products or orders table. And the policies set, what do I do with this table? They do not specify whether I'm allowed to delete stuff from the products table, just what happens if I try and the deletion um, affects this table. Uh, and, and, and so uh, it's also worth considering that the converse is significant too. The, these policies have no bearing whatsoever, literally whatsoever, on modifications I make to the order contents table. If I try and delete stuff from the order contents table, none of those policies make any difference at all. They refer to the relationship between order contents and orders, and order contents and products. So I can delete, it. none of these policies, even this restrict, have any bearing on my ability to delete rows from the order contents table. Although there might be other tables that exist somewhere in my database that have similar policies defined with foreign keys onto order contents. Uh, and then finally, and this is, I mean, I'm, even as I say this, I'm thinking I'm trying to cook up ways of having multiple levels of foreign keys on an exam question, but um, you can have a foreign key in one table referring to a second table and have that second table contain a foreign key referring to a third table. There could be multiple layers. Remember that a cascade um, policy means that a modification of the parent table cascades down to the table that refers to it. That cascade can go multiple levels deep, but if at any level along the way a restrict is encountered, the whole operation, all layers of the cascade, fail. So nothing is done if any restrict occurs on any level of a, of a um, multiple layer cascade. And I know that this is a tie, you're staring at a slide and people drawing on slides doesn't really help you understand this, which is why this is, it's good to have slides, I guess. I will post a second video where I show off all the ways these, all the implications of these policies. Um, so that's one thing about foreign keys. We'll talk about that again in the second part of this lecture in the second video. Um, so now we can talk more about different kinds of constraints. So uh, we have this basic constraint called a check constraint, and it tells the database whenever this column or whenever a particular table or column is modified, check something. And so I have two ways of adding them, just like when I create primary keys. Notice how you can create a primary key by sticking it right after a column, or you can put it down at the end and use multiple columns. Um, you can put a check constraint after a specific column definition, or you could put a check constraint just at the table scope, where it could use any number of columns of the table. So uh, a check constraint defines a Boolean condition, a true or false value. If that condition evaluates to true, then the row is allowed to exist. If an operation would do something to a row that would result in that constraint, that the condition having the value false, the operation is, uh, it fails. It, it is not allowed to occur. So for example, here I could require that the price per kilogram of every product be, be greater, strictly greater than zero and strictly less than 100. If I try to insert a product with price 101, the insertion fails and does not occur. I can also check that each product's name has at least zero characters. There actually are a couple of ways of doing this. Uh, sorry, it has more than zero characters. Um, I could check that the length is greater than zero. That definitely works. Length is just a function in Postgres that gives you the length of a string, maybe unsurprisingly. I could also do something like check that name is not equal to empty string. That, that would actually also work. Um, but the, the purpose of that constraint is to make sure your product name always contains at least one character. Uh, and so if I try and do an insert or an update such that that constraints condition comes back false, whatever operation I'm trying to do is denied. Uh, and so where I define a check constraint is my business. Uh, personally, I'd rather do it this way. I don't like putting constraints bare. I don't like having constraints stuck at the end of column definitions. It turns out you can stick foreign key uh, definitions at the end of a column definition too. And I haven't even shown you how to do that because I feel like it's way better given how bulky those definitions are to have them by themselves at the end of the um, uh, create statement. Um, so here's an example of maybe something. Yeah, you have to really think carefully to come up with good examples of these um, check constraints sort of in the wilderness. They're very useful in larger databases, but it's sort of hard to come up with basic examples that are, that are in a vacuum. Um, so, okay, I'm gonna make a table of unit vectors, uh, vectors whose length is one. And so what is a, these are in two dimensions. So I've got my X coordinate, and my Y coordinate, I got my primary key, and then I have to have a check constraint that enforces that the length of the vector equals one. Now, because it's a, a unit vector, I just have to enforce that X squared plus Y squared equals one. You know that you, you may recall that um, the actual length of a vector is equal to this quantity, but because I'm enforcing that the length equals one, it's actually fine for me to enforce that, um, that I have this. So uh, just to be clear, what I've done here is I've squared both sides and then 
x squared plus y squared equals one squared. Uh, so um, the check constraint guarantees that every vector I add will actually have that property. So if I add a bunch of things that I know to be unit vectors, so 1, 0, 0, 1, apparently 0 0.6, 0 0.8, the constraint passes and the insertions succeed. If I try to add this, um, the constraint does not pass and the insertion just fails. It is not allowed. Um, it turns out that there are implementations. Some, some DBMSs actually allow you to have stuff in the check constraint be a nested select, but not Postgres, so we won't pursue it further. Generally, if Postgres, I, I, I think, takes the position that if you want something more advanced than a basic condition in any, in any uh, variant, um, you should write a, a, a function, which we'll get to in a minute. So, so the check constraints in Postgres are pretty straightforward. Um, we'll discover, and on assignment six, you'll have lots of fun with this, that now that we have check constraints, we really should be adding them for everything. Now, we have to be very careful um, that we don't add constraints for things that are sort of un unreasonable. So, so um, I might argue that this constraint is a little bit weird. I think it's probably sort of harmless. It's saying you can't add an order whose date is in the future. It has to be before or equal to the current time. That's still a little bit dangerous, but just in the spirit of adding constraints for everything today, why not do it? Um, now that we have them, we'll discover that, especially on assignment six, you really want to add a lot of them. Uh, you want to, inf anything that isn't enforced by typing, you would like to enforce with a check constraint. So one example would be, if you have a price, you should make sure the price is greater than or equal to zero with a check constraint. Um, order numbers, greater than or equal to zero. Customers' names, they should be non-empty. Um, if that's something you expect, you should encode it into the database to force it to always be true. Anybody querying this database will never ever see a case where a customer's name is empty, it has no characters, or an order number is less than zero, because these check constraints, as constraints, given that we have the consistency expectation in our ACID framework, are always enforced. So at any given time, anybody observing the database will observe a state where all of those conditions are true. So anything a type doesn't give you, you should probably that you expect to be true, you should enforce with a check constraint. So one example is if I have a um, uh, a price. Uh, and I've decided my price has type int, then I guess I don't need a constraint to tell me that the price has no fractional component because it's an int. But uh, if, it's a, if it's an int, it could be negative, so I need to make sure that it's greater than zero using a check constraint. Um, so, uh, yeah, okay, yeah, this, is, that's, uh, this is pointing out a couple of things. But uh, I'm, in this case, adding my, as I will for most of the course, I'm adding my check constraints in the create statement. It turns out there is notation to add them afterwards. I can actually impose new constraints on a table after it's been created. It's also, I don't know why it's that important, but I could just make one big check constraint for all four of these conditions. It turns out there's not much benefit to doing that necessarily. I, maybe efficiency. I, I, there are reasons why if you have four distinct check constraints, they're stored as four values in the database, but I, I wouldn't worry too much about it. I think it's better to have several separate constraints one for each distinct thing you're enforcing. Um, I'm also allowed to give uh, my check, so here's my check constraint from before. I'm allowed if I want to, to give it a name and I have to say constraint and then I have to give it whatever name I want um, before I, I specify the constraint. Uh, if I do that, the advantage of giving it a name is that I am allowed to delete the constraint later or modify it. If it has a name, I can refer back to it. So uh, not that we need this notation too much in this course, but there is this, uh, this notation you can use, alter table and then drop constraint to delete a constraint from the table. Once you've deleted it, it no longer is required to hold. You can then add things. So if I were to delete the constraint here, these two insertions would succeed after all. Um, you don't generally need to do that, just like alter table, like I said in the previous lecture. Alter table is a good thing to know about. You don't need to use it too much in practice. It tends to be for long-term database, database maintenance. You might want to modify the schema a bit, add columns, remove constraints, whatever. And you can, you can just like you can remove constraints after the fact, you can also add them after the fact. It, generally speaking, it, it is worthwhile to name all your constraints. Even if you don't intend to delete them later, if you name them and you do decide to delete them years later, it's easier to do that. Uh, now, it's true that every DBMS does give you a way, even if I didn't have a name for this constraint, there would be a way of going and finding it and deleting it. It would be given some cryptic internal name. But it is assumed that, you know, for the sake of readability, you should give constraints a name. 
So we ultimately, though, check constraints don't give us the ability to do anything besides check things inside of a single row. There's sort of like a, a very restricted where clause. Uh, when I try to insert or modify a row, the check constraints are evaluated with respect to that one row, and then they pass or fail. If I want to define constraints that are more global, um, so for example, uh, every major must have less than 10 students in it, that doesn't really apply to one row, right? I mean, I, I, I could be adding, when I add a student to a major, I'm adding one row. Uh, I want to define a maximum number of rows that can ever refer to the same thing. Or every student can take at, at most 10 courses or something like that. So what I need is the ability to define constraints that allow me to evaluate literally anything I want. I just go and evaluate some Boolean condition. Um, there is something in SQL, a standardized SQL feature that nobody seems to implement for some reason called an assertion, which is just any Boolean condition you want. And it's like a check constraint that's evaluated every time a table is modified, um, but it can be anything. It just verifies for every row of the table that a specific condition holds. Uh, and it can be, it can involve nested select statements or aggregation or joins or whatever. Um, the problem is, if you think about that, every time you modify a table, you have to evaluate this assertion on every row of the table. That's pretty ugly and you need a lot of optimization to avoid evaluating it superfluously. And because that's a tough one, most DBMSs just don't allow you to do it. And unfortunately, Postgres is one of them. If Postgres supported assertions, we wouldn't really have to worry about that PL, PG, SQL stuff, but Postgres doesn't. So we have to fall back on this other option. So a trigger, not necessarily a constraint, because a trigger can be used for lots of things. Uh, a trigger is a, an action, usually a function um, that you've written, an action that is run uh, under whenever a certain operation is performed. So you could define a trigger to occur before any insertion operation continues on a table or after every insertion into a particular table or update or deletion. Um, you are also allowed to define a trigger to, uh, that can either modify the operation in progress or um, that can prevent the operation from occurring. And so we can therefore use a trigger as a constraint. We can define a trigger that runs before every insertion or update on a table. And in the trigger, we can verify that all of our constraints are upheld. And if they aren't, we can say this, ins this insertion or update must fail. It's interesting because triggers are arbitrary functions. You can actually have them do whatever you want. So you could have a trigger that runs every time you insert into the products table, and part of that trigger, it goes and modifies the order contents table or something. Now that's allowed. It's a bit weird. And there are reasons why you might want to do it, um, but it, it's because it's an arbitrary function. Now, this is the thing where I, I can't do justice to it in slides. I'll make an effort, but go watch the secondary video that I post about me going through the, the code, because that'll probably help. So um, triggers are a thing SQL supports in general, but the actual syntax, just like functions, is, is distinct in every implementation. We have to be very careful here because the database systems book um, apparently tries to speak real SQL. Um, but nobody supports real SQL. Just like with assertions, the database systems book um, exists in a strange altered reality where database, where DBMS implement, imp, implementers have actually gone and implemented proper SQL syntax. Although every DBMS supports, you know, select statements and insert statements, as the, the standard is pretty large and a lot of DBMSs just don't support a lot of things. So please do not use the book for this part of the course. Um, it doesn't use the same notation as Postgres. It, none of it will work on Postgres. I will post links to the Postgres manual pages for the trigger stuff, which I think should be enough for our purposes. And actually, I think given my previous experience, the stuff I post from this lecture and others might be enough for most people to write their own triggers. So um, there actually are, in theory, SQL, general SQL syntax allows you to specify triggers that are just basic um, sort of cause effect things. You say, if this condition holds, do that. Like if the, if the row being inserted has this property, reject, otherwise don't reject. Um, Postgres only allows one type of trigger, which is just every time an insertion or update or whatever happens, call a function. And the function either you know, succeeds or throws an exception. And if it throws an exception, the insertion or update or whatever fails. Here we are back at the fruit database again. Um, and just like the last lecture, I've posted a special version of this schema with extra stuff in it that, we, that contains examples of these features that I'll go through in a separate video. Let's create some triggers. First, and these are, of course are completely arbitrary. I would like to create a trigger uh, which enforces the constraint that every order has at most three items. So if you attempt to add a fourth item to any order, that operation must fail. 
Um, and then uh, I want to prevent anybody from ever ordering that product because it's, it's for their own good. They, I mean, I don't know why they're trying to order it, but just, you know, I, I can't in good faith allow them to do that. So we will add a constraint to our database where if they ever attempt to, to order a product whose name is this, that will be denied. Um, now, I'm going to define a couple of other triggers to demonstrate the other functionality you could use them for. And on assignment six, there are a couple of places where using this would come in handy, although it's not a constraint. So a constraint is some condition that um, is always observed by every uh, row in the database as it applies, um, and that if every anybody looking at the database from outside with queries or whatever will always observe the constraint to be obeyed. A trigger is just a function, and you can define a trigger to run before or after any insert operation or update or delete. And so you could actually define triggers to do all sorts of weird stuff. So one example would be, um, we'll define a trigger that every time somebody tries to order a product named Apple, the order will be silently modified, so they attempt to insert the row for Apple, we will instead modify that row to be pair. So if they, so no insertion will ever actually put the row apple into the um, order contents table. Instead, everybody that tries to order an apple will get a pair instead. Um, another one we'll do, which is, this is the one that might be useful on assignment six. If I try and insert the same product twice into my products table, the second insertion usually fails because you can't insert two products with the same product ID. But maybe for whatever reason, I would rather that just get ignored. If I try to insert the product um, Apple with ID 1 10 times, well, it's the same ID every, it's the same product every time. Can we just ignore the last nine insertions? Don't give me an error, just do nothing. Just silently throw that away. And there are reasons why that can be helpful. Assignment 6 contains an example of one of those cases. And that's to demonstrate I'm not enforcing a constraint because it's not, it, it's not creating an error. It's not preventing the insertion. It's just silently choosing to ignore certain operations. Okay, so um, I'm creating, a, for all of these uh, uh, trigger functions, I create a function with no arguments, and its return type in our weird PGSQL language is this special keyword trigger. Um, and when you define a uh, trigger function, even if it takes no arguments, there's a special variable that exists. Um, it's of, it, it, formally, its type is a row, although, what, I mean, really, what does that mean without knowing too much about the, the type hierarchy? There's a special global variable called new, and that's, that refers to whatever row uh, caused the trigger to run. So for example, if I try to insert a row and I run a trigger because I've configured a trigger to run on every insertion, then the value new will be the row that I'm trying to insert. And for deletion triggers, it will be, uh, it'll be called old, the value I'm trying to delete. And so if it's a, uh, in this case, I'm going to define a trigger that always runs when I do an insertion on order contents. So of course, the new row will be a row of order contents. So it'll have an order number value. And this trigger, it, the, the purpose of this trigger is to um, intercept and prevent any attempt to add a fourth item to the order. So uh, I'm going to uh, phrase this in terms of when do I have uh, too many things in the order? Like, Suppose that I let you insert this row, and once you've inserted it, I discover that the order has four things in it. It has more than three things. Well, of course, in that case, I shouldn't have allowed you to insert the row. So I'm going to phrase the constraint that way, as if the insertion has already happened, and then I have to go back and see whether it should have been allowed. So this would formally be a constraint that is enforced after the insertion. Now, interestingly, uh, that sounds a bit contradictory. Why am I trying to enforce the constraint after the insertion has already occurred? Um, the key there is that uh, even after the insertion has occurred, I still have the option of undoing it. And there are reasons to enforce it before and to enforce it after. We'll discover later that it's really helpful, if you can, to try and define constraints that um, are evaluated after insertions, because that allows us to delay their enforcement just a little bit longer. So what happens inside the constraint? I would like to reject any situation that would put more than three things in an order. So what I will do is this. First, I know what order you're trying to add something to because you've given me a new row. And new.orderNum will be the order number of the row that you're modifying, or of the order that you're modifying. So I will select, I'll just use a select statement to count the number of products currently in that order. Remember that we're assuming that this insertion has already happened. So I've already added my new item. And I ask how many total items are in that order right now. If it's greater than three, I raise an exception. Otherwise, I just return the new row, unmodified. I just leave it. 
So the way that these constraints are enforced, uh, constraints enforced by trigger functions, is if it returns the row in any form, the insertion is allowed. If it raises an exception, the entire insertion is undone. Even if it's already occurred, the insertion is undone. Um, and so, yeah, it points out that because this is intercepting an attempt to insert into order contents, the row that I'm trying to insert, which will be called new, can be assumed to be a row of the order contents table, and therefore it has, you know, product ID and order number and, and uh, kilograms bought. So if I use a trigger to implement a typical constraint, so to allow or uh, disallow an operation, then we should expect either it, it succeeds with no side effects and returns the new row unmodified, uh, or it raises an exception. Now, um, the exception, as you can see, can contain some sort of error message. Um, we generally, on the assignment, uh, aren't going to care too much about what error message you use, but frankly, it's good to use a descriptive error message. We mostly care for assignment six that the insertion is prevented. Um, remember, of course, from the last lecture, if you go to finding functions, make sure to put the drop function if exists line beforehand so that that way if you have to run the script more than once, it doesn't create an error the second time through, which can be really annoying to debug. Um, so I've made the function to actually evaluate the constraint. Now I have to attach the function to the table. Just making this function doesn't do anything. It, it just creates a function I can call. I need to then attach it to the table as a trigger that is run every time a specific operation occurs. Um, and so here I will say create um, trigger order content size constraint. So in this case, the name I'm using here is not the name of the function. It's the name of the trigger that I'm attaching to the table. And I want to give it therefore a separate name than the function I just created because I can delete the attachment between the, the trigger, the function and the table without deleting the function itself. So they're two separate things. Um, so I create the trigger and it occurs after any insert or update operation on order contents for each row. So every row that I insert or update, um, the trigger is called separately for each row. There, is a, there are other options here besides row. Um, we're not going to talk about them because they're complicated. Well, they're not necessarily more complicated, but their use case is much more complicated. So for each row, execute this procedure order content size trigger. So for every row that is that I insert or update, after I've actually added it to my table, execute the procedure that I just had. Now, again, it seems a little bit bizarre that I would be trying to enforce my constraint after inserting or updating the row. And we'll see later why it's useful to think about things that way. We have the option of running the constraint before as well, which we'll see in a minute. Um, when we do this, the insertion's already happened, we run the constraint, but if the constraint raises an exception, the insertion is undone. So I am still able to reverse the operation, and that, that's a key point. So the idea of running the, the, the trigger after is a bit odd, but it doesn't affect the ability of the trigger to prevent the operation. Um, and the, the reason why uh, that we do this is because we're going to see later that we like having constraints where we can put off their enforcement for a little while. So maybe I want to run four insert statements and then enforce all the constraints. We know that in the long term all the constraints have to be enforced. But if I want the freedom to enforce the constraint a little bit later, it has to be one that I enforce after the insertion. Because logically, if it's supposed to happen beforehand, how can I tell the database to delay its enforcement until after, the, until, uh, after I've done a few more statements? Um, and so that, that's the key issue here. I know it seems a bit counterintuitive. It'll sink in over the next couple of lectures. Um, I would prefer that you use this as your default model of when to write a constraint. It's perfectly valid to write constraints that execute, or, or sorry, triggers that execute before. Um, and we'll see examples of why that's useful. Uh, but if you want a constraint that just enforces a condition, so that, for example, orders have no more than three items, you should try and, and internalize defining it as a constraint, as, as a trigger that executes after the insertion or update. Um, this means, of course, because it runs after, if you, do a, if you run a query inside your constraint function, the inserted row will be in the table. So you, can, you should expect to see your new row in the table when you run any queries on that table from inside the um, constraint function. So here is our uh, no pineapples constraint. Uh, if, so I, I, any attempt to insert a, uh, into my order contents table, uh, the order of a, a, uh, any product called pineapple is supposed to fail. So you try to insert a new row into order contents. I look at its product ID and I ask the question, is the product ID equal to, I don't know, whatever the ID of pineapple is? So I go, I go look up the ID of pineapple. If it is, then I deny the insertion. I say, can't do it. 
uh, and then I would attach the, the trigger to the table using this. So it's actually exactly the same as the previous one. I've just changed the names. Um, so here is a trigger function uh, that is designed to run before an insertion operation. Now, formally, this isn't, well, okay, there are a couple of reasons this is not a constraint, but the obvious one might be that it doesn't actually enforce anything. It just does, it makes a modification. So this trigger is supposed to be run between you sending the, the row, the insertion statement to the database, and the database actually doing anything to the table. So before the row gets added to the table, it's handed over to this trigger function. So um, the trigger function gets a new row for the order contents table, and it first asks, hey, are you trying to order an apple? Is the product ID for this row uh, the ID for apple? If the answer is yes, then I'm going to modify it. Notice how I'm actually allowed to modify the contents of my new row. I modify my new row to actually contain the ID of pair. And because this gets run before the insertion, I'm allowed to modify it. And then whatever ends up getting inserted is just my modified version. You'll notice that the, um, the, this operator here is the comparison. I'm asking if two things are equal. And that means if I want to use an assignment statement, I can't use that operator. And so in PGSQL, this is the assignment operator which is the same operator Pascal uses, Pascal being a pretty contemporary language to original SQL. And we don't, these days when you ask somebody about Pascal, they say, oh, Pascal's a nice teaching language, which I think is supposed to be damning it with faint praise or something. Um, so this trigger obviously makes no sense to run after the insertion because its job is to intercept the insertion and, make a, and, and modify it before it gets into the table. Uh, and so the slide describes what it does. So here I define the trigger to happen before the insert operation uh, because I, I want to look at the row before it goes in and maybe modify it. And I'm allowed to do that. This is just a trigger, not a constraint. And there's a subtle difference. Uh, a constraint is something that is either in, like the, the result of a constraint being enforced is either success or failure. A trigger is just a function that you run. And a trigger, in this case, the trigger always, I guess, succeeds. In some cases, it also modifies the row. It's not a constraint. It's not enforcing some condition. It's just making modifications to the row if needed. Uh, and we'll see that defining something as a constraint allows, it to, allows the enforcement of the constraint to be deferred, which we'll talk about in the next lecture. Um, so uh, here is uh, that trigger function I discussed earlier, that if you try and insert the same product into the database multiple times, I'll just ignore every subsequent insertion. I won't let the error occur. And so this trigger also runs before the insertion, because obviously the database would give an error if the insertion were ever to run. Uh, and what it does is um, you, it's designed to run on the products table. So you hand me a new row for the products table. And I, I'm just going to go looking. Are there any, this query computes, are there any products or how many products are there in the table already with the same ID as the new one? If there, is, uh, if there are greater than zero of them, so if there is already at least one product, you'll notice it has to be one. If there is already a product with that ID, then do this, return null. So it turns out if you're writing a before trigger on an, uh, on an insertion and you return null, nothing happens. The insertion is, is abandoned. So there's no error. It appears that the insertion succeeded, but nothing actually gets added to the table. Um, the alter I mean, so you can also make an insertion not happen by creating an error, but the whole point of this trigger is to make the error that would result from inserting a product twice disappear. And so one thing you can do is just throw the row away. If you return null from the before trigger, the row is just discarded, and the insertion operation is, is assumed to have to, to, to succeed, it's just that nothing gets inserted into the table. And you can see the else there is just return new. So if this whole if statement doesn't execute, we just return the new row intact. We don't try to modify it. Um, and there's the, the statement that I would use to actually um, add that, attach that to the products table. Again, it's a before insert trigger. Uh, okay, so I'll post just like before, I'll post a second video. This was a bit, even for my taste, a bit dry. I'll post a second video where I actually go through this um, and show off using, defining, and then using all of these different uh, triggers and trigger constraints.